Hey, and welcome back to New Testament Survey here at Liberty Point Baptist Church. We've made it up to our sixth week here. We're at the halfway point uh, this morning, and uh, today we are in the book of Romans. We've been working our way through the entire New Testament, and so uh, beginning next week, we'll, we'll pick up the pace. We'll, we'll cover two books next week, First and Second Corinthians, but today we are in the book of Romans. Uh, just so happens to be my favorite book of the New Testament. Uh, I, I say that about lots of books, but Romans is definitely one that, that is close to my heart. It's, it's my favorite for sure. Uh, and in fact, it has been that way for lots of people throughout history. Uh, before we dive into the book, let me just share with you some, some different thoughts from individuals about the book of Romans. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, This epistle is in truth the most important document in the New Testament, the gospel in its purest expression. Not only is it well worth a Christian's while to know it word for word by heart, but also to meditate on it day by day. It is the soul's daily bread and can never be read too often or studied too much. The more you probe into it, the more precious it becomes and the better its flavor. Uh, Martin Luther well, loved the book of Romans and really and truly grasped and understood the gospel because of what he found in the book of Romans, which led him to go on to, uh, to lead the Reformation. Not just Martin Luther, though. Um, the gospel justification by faith uh, has, has certainly played a, a central role from the book of Romans being taught uh, to the point where John Calvin would say this, when anyone gains a knowledge of this epistle, he has an entrance open to him to all the most hidden treasures of Scripture. You see, all throughout history, people have talked about the importance of the book of Romans and, and how impactful it has been to their life. And so I want to lay, once again, just a foundation. We're not going to dive too deep uh, into the book of Romans, but just lay a foundation to give us a, a, a jumping board, a springboard, uh, to be able to, to dig deeper into this book and to see uh, all of its riches. Uh, so following our same pattern, we'll start talking about the author of this book. And so I, I will tell you that there's never been much debate about who wrote the book of Romans. Uh, we see it right in the very first verse. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Uh, so Paul takes credit for it uh, right from the get-go. He, he makes it clear that, that he is the one who, who authors this book. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it is important to note for our study, if we go to chapter 16, verse 22, the last chapter of the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 22, it says this, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Uh, so Paul takes credit for it in chapter 1, and someone named Tertius takes credit for it at the end. Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned, there's never been much debate about who wrote this book. We know that Paul wrote this book, but as was a very common practice in Paul's day, uh, he would dictate and have someone else to write these things down for him. Uh, so basically, someone would, would serve as a secretary uh, of some sorts to be able to, to write the things that Paul was, was asking him to write. And so Tertius uh, is the one who, who's putting pen to paper, so to speak. Uh, and writing these things out. Uh, so, so we know that, that Paul is, uh, is the author. Who's he writing it to? Um, again, very easy to, to imagine. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church at Rome, uh, writing to the, to the Romans. Uh, he says so in verse 7, uh, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. He says, I'm, I'm writing to, to the Christians in Rome. And so what do we know about the Christians in Rome? We know that it's a mix of Jewish Christians as well as Gentile Christians. It, it is a, a, a strong mix of both of those. And we see both flavors, <laughs> if you will, in the, gospel, or in the book of Romans. We see Paul speaking to the Gentiles and we see Paul speaking to, to those with a Jewish background. Uh, it, it, so he's writing this with both Jewish and Gentile Christians uh, in mind. And so what's his purpose in, in, in writing to these people? What, does he have something in mind? Uh, we'll, we'll see in later letters that Paul writes, he's writing to address some problems, but not necessarily in the book of Romans. 
Paul has been on this missionary journey. He's dealt with some churches. He's planted churches and he's encouraged churches. And so as he writes this letter, he's basically writing it uh, out of experiences that he's already shared. And so uh, it was out of past mission work and, and his anticipation of, of future work uh, that caused him to address some issues that he had already engaged or addressed in other places. Uh, and, and so he's writing to, to deal with those things maybe before they even come up uh, in, in the church at Rome. Uh, what, what does the structure uh, of, of this book look like? Well, let me remind you, it's a letter, and, and so it's written like a letter. Uh, it, it follows the same patterns of letters from that time, from the Hellenistic uh, period. Uh, you, you get an introduction, you get a, a, a section of thanksgiving, uh, then the body of the letter and, and a closing greeting. And so Paul follows that, that same pattern. Uh, if we wanted to, to be a little more general to talk about maybe the body of the letter, what does that structure look like? Uh, it, it follows a similar pattern of, of most of Paul's other letters as well, where he starts off with, with theological truths. Uh, and so he, he begins by, by teaching some truths and then he moves to more practical things at the end of the letter. So basically, he, he follows this pattern of, let, let me tell you some truths, some, some theology, if you will. And, and once you grasp this, we'll talk about how to apply it to your lives. And, and so Paul follows that same pattern. Uh, up to chapter 12, we see those, those deep theological truths that Paul is trying to get across. And then after chapter 12, it's basically, what does this look like? being lived out? How, how does this transform our lives? How does this make us live differently? Uh, and, and so Paul follows that pattern in, in Romans as well. And so uh, that's what the, the structure of, uh, of his letter looks like. If you wanted to break it down, it might look something like this. An, an introduction comes in chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Then the gospel is the righteousness of God by faith. Uh, it is in chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 4, verse 25. Chapter 5, we see that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And that goes through chapter 8, verse 39. Beginning in chapter 9, we see the relationship between the gospel and Israel. And it raises a question that requires vindicating God's righteousness. Chapter 9, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 36. And in chapter 12, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we see that the gospel transforms lives. And that's Romans 12, 1 through chapter 15, verse 13. And then the conclusion begins in chapter 15, verse 14, and goes through the end of the book uh, as it concludes there. Uh, so that's, that's the, the, the quick structure of what the book of Romans looks like. So let's, let's dive into the theme. This is the, the, the part that I, I enjoy the most. Uh, the, the first theme, uh, and this is definitely the theme of the entire book of Romans, would, would be the gospel, the gospel. Now, if someone were to ask you, hey, hey tell me what the gospel is, uh, I hope that you could give them an answer. And, and maybe you, you can pause this video and, and try to come up with an answer. Uh, but hopefully it would include something like what well, the gospel literally means good news. And, and so, so what is the good news? What, what, what is this good news that, that I need to hear about? Uh, and so as, as we, we dive into to what that good news is, hopefully you can, you can um, clearly articulate what, what the gospel is. And I think in order to truly be able to articulate what the gospel or what the good news is, we've got to first be able to see that there's some bad news. So imagine, if you will, uh, you're, you're a healthy individual, you exercise, you eat well, don't have, a, don't have an ache or a pain, no physical problems whatsoever, mentally strong, uh, and, and somebody comes to you and they say, man, I found the cure for what's wrong with you. You would go, well, I, there's, there's nothing wrong with me. I feel great. Well, yeah, but this, this is the cure for all your problems. Well, but I, don't, I don't have any problems, so I, I don't need the cure and so in order for us to really and truly appreciate the gospel and understand that there is some good news, we've got to understand that there is some bad news. And so Paul, in explaining the gospel, helps us to see that there is some bad news. He does so really in the first three chapters of the book of Romans. He lays out that there is some bad news. And so he, he understands and, and tries to convince uh, all of us, 
that, that we are sinful and stand unrighteous before God. And so in the first three chapters, he, he makes this case. Uh, particularly in chapter three, Paul does an excellent job of helping us see that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, uh, he, he makes that case clear. And so if, if we understand that there's some bad news, then we can greatly appreciate the good news. So, so what is the good news? The good news is that even though we are unrighteous, even though that we are sinful people, that Jesus Christ paid the debt that we owed. He took our sin upon himself and died in our place so that we could become the righteousness of God. And so Paul says, hey, there is some good news, but first you need to understand the bad news. And when we understand the bad news, then we can really and truly appreciate the good news, which is the gospel. This is, this is the good news uh, of what Jesus has done for us. And so that first theme uh, starts in chapter one. Paul says, called to be an apostle, set apart, set apart for the gospel. Uh, Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17, he tells us uh, yet again that I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation, first to the Jew, to, first to the Jew but also to the Greek. Uh, and, and so we see the gospel in the, in the beginning, but it, all the way through in chapters 15, uh, he, he closes out this letter as he's moving to his conclusion, uh, again, continuing to talk uh, about the gospel because he knows that the gospel is what saves people. Uh, and, and so Paul, Paul wants us to see that the gospel is the, the overarching uh, theme of this entire book. Now, as we look at our, at our second theme, it really uh, kind of dives in a little deeper into the first theme. Uh, and, and so we're not just talking about the gospel, but our second theme is the gospel of justification by faith, the gospel of justification by faith. Most people uh, would, would say that this is the overarching theme of the book of Romans. In fact, uh, this was the belief of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and, and even Mark Dever says that justification is the word that could be used to sum up the entire letter. Uh, and, and so justification by faith is, is certainly a, a key point and a, and a key theme in the book of Romans. So, so what is justification? Uh, Wayne Grudem gives us a great definition. I love this definition. He says, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, and two, declares us to be righteous in his sight. Again, justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as being, being our own and declaring us to be righteous in his sight. Uh, so as we think about that definition, an instantaneous legal act, God, because of his grace, because of our faith in him, he instantaneous uh, gives us the righteousness of Christ and thinks of our sins as forgiven and makes us righteous in his sight. And so how can this happen if Paul has already told us this bad news that, that, that we are sinful people? In fact, let's, let's look at Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. He says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He says, hey, let me just remind you, these people are unrighteous. You are unrighteous. No one is seeking after God. But how can we be made right if we are unrighteous? How can we be made right with God? Thankfully, Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith 
in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Man, how beautiful is that, that God has decided that he is going to be just, but he's also going to justify us because of our faith in Christ. Uh, and, and so it's only by faith in him and it's only made possible by his grace. And so we see all through the book of Romans that we are justified by grace through faith uh, and that, that God has done this uh, for us. So uh, if someone tries to talk about being justified by our works, uh, we, we need to remind them to go back and take a look at the book of Romans uh, because it is truly a work of God. We are justified by faith and not by our works. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that, that, that works uh, don't, don't play a, a, an important part in our lives, but when it comes to our salvation, it's grace by faith. Um, and, and so the, the idea of justification by faith is certainly an extremely important uh, theme in the book of Romans. Our third theme uh, is, is one that's a, a little bit more challenging to tackle, uh, but Paul, Paul hits it head on. And the third theme would be Jews, Gentiles, and the people of God. Jews, Gentiles, and the people of God. Uh, we know that, that the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, uh, we know that they are important to God. We know throughout the entire Old Testament that God has said that, that they are his chosen people, that, that they are a people of his own possession. And, and so we know that God has made promises to them. And yet when the Messiah comes, when Jesus arrives on the scene, the very people whom he had promised uh, that, that he would come were the people who rejected him uh, for, uh, most often and, and the most. And so how, how do we reconcile that God has promised his goodness to all of these people and yet they are the people uh, that, that reject him? Uh, Mark Dever says it like this, the problem begins with Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. If we can be justified only by faith in Christ and Israel has rejected Christ, then it seems that Israel will be rejected. Yet God promised Israel blessing and inheritance through Abraham. Do you see the problem? And so we, we know that there, this is a, a, a tough, uh, tough dynamic to, to be able uh, to, to walk through. And so Paul says, hey, I, I want you to know that God's promises for Israel are true. Uh, that, that God's promise for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people, th those things are, are, are still true. And so in chapters 9 through 11, he tries to help us understand uh, that, that there will still be a, a, a number of, of Jewish people who, who are going to come to faith uh, in Christ, that there, there is going to be a, a revival. I, I think he, he kind of points to that. But he also helps us to see uh, that, that the Gentiles are a part of this as well. That, uh, that, that it's not just a promise for the, for the Jewish people. Paul shows that, that God has not rejected his people, but instead he proves that the Gentiles are, are in view uh, when it comes to God's saving plan. Uh, and, and so God has not just come for the Jewish people, he, he's come for all people. And it's important to note, even in the Old Testament, when God is talking about his chosen people and uh, the people of, uh, of his own possession, that that he also includes anyone and everyone who would come and be a part of that. He invites the nations to come even in the Old Testament. So God has a heart for the nations from the beginning. And so it's important for us to, to make sure that that is clear. And so as Paul is talking about Jews uh, in, in the book of Romans, he makes sure that we also understand that the Gentiles are included in this group as well, which brings us to our third group, the people of God. You see, he's not just talking about Jews and he's not just talking about Gentiles, 
He says that we've all been brought in together to be the people of God. And he talks about how there is now no distinction. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 11 through 13 says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, hey, let me just remind you, Jew, Greek, Jew, Gentile, we're, we're talking about the people of God. Uh, and so when we understand that Paul is bringing Jew and Gentile together under the, the banner of God's salvation and, and his salvific purposes, then we really understand the, the foundation of what it means to be the people of God. It's not bound by culture. It's not bound by ethnicity that, that we're talking about those who have trusted in Christ and found salvation in him and in him alone. Which brings us to our fourth theme. Uh, the fourth theme is the gospel and the Christian life. Let me, let me pause just for a second. Chapters 9 through 11 are heavy, heavy stuff in the book of Romans. I'm not going to deny that. But I think Paul's purpose there is to help us to see uh, that, that, that God is doing a work everywhere. And he, he's bringing together a people. Uh, so just want to make that clear that, that I'm not just saying that that's all that is being said in chapters 9 through 11. But I think that's the overall theme that, that Paul is trying to get across. Again, theme number four, the gospel and the Christian life. Uh, put, put, put it simply here, make it real easy. If we grasp chapters 1 through 11, if we, if we work to... To, to really get a handle on that and to be able to understand chapters 1 through 11, then chapters 12 through 16 should really characterize our life. It, it, this, should, this should be what our lives look like. This is how we live it out. So again, moving from theology to application and, and, and practicality uh, is Paul's pattern here. And so he, he does that in chap, beginning in chapter 12. So if we understand the gospel, we understand the good news that Jesus became the sacrifice for us, that that he was the propitiation for our sin. If we grasp that and understand that he laid down his life for us, then we should be willing to lay down our life for him in response. This is what it should look like. And so that's exactly where Paul goes in in chapter 12, uh, right, right from the beginning of chapter 12. Look at what he says. Chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He he says, hey, if you understand what Christ has done for you, how he laid his life down and gave his life for you, then you ought to be willing to, to be a living sacrifice for him, to lay your life down every day. And so he he, he builds on this and, and begins to talk about what it looks like to, to live this out. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. L- let me just read a few things to you. He says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Now let's just pause there because it keeps going with telling us of the things that that we should do and how we should live out our faith. And so Paul is, is being very practical of saying, hey, if you understand this, then your life should look different. So if I were to ask you, hey, is it possible for someone to be a Christian and their life not change at all? I think the answer is no, that's not possible. Because once we turn from our sin, we're literally turning away from those things and turning to something else. That's what repentance looks like. It's turning away, a change of direction, a change of mind. And so Paul is telling us, hey, if you grasp this, this is what your life should look like. Let me give you a, a model. And so he talks in chapter 12 about the practicality and, and the, the general application of this. And then in chapter 13, he even gives us uh, how the, the Christians should, should live in light of the government. Uh, what, what should that relationship look like in, in chapter 13? So again, really practical things that, that he's helping us to see. This is what the gospel and the, and the Christian life 
looks like. This is, this is how we live this out. By the way, what does he say about uh, the Christian and government? Basically, that the Christian should follow the government as long as the government does not go against God and, and the commands of God. He also tells us that we should pray for leaders while seeking to, to do right in society. And so, so Paul is being very practical on what this looks like. But again, it's the gospel and the Christian life. How, how do we live this thing out? And so that's our, our fourth and final theme uh, in, in the book of Romans. So, so if we're going to summarize this up, give us a, a, a one-sentence summary. Maybe it looks something like this, that, that Romans uh, seems to be that the gospel of justification by faith brings about obedience for the glory of God. The gospel of justification by faith brings about obedience for the glory of God. So that's, that's a quick summary and, and a quick foundation of what the book of Romans looks like. But we said again, that the goal, the overall theme of the book of Romans was the gospel. And so if you've never trusted in Christ, if you've never experienced what Jesus can do for you, man, I pray that, that you would grasp a hold of, uh, of the good news of realizing that even though we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory, that Jesus has already paid the price. He's made our righteousness possible, not because we're good, but because he is. And if we turn away from our sin and turn and trust in Christ, then he forgives us and God views us as righteous in his sight. What a beautiful picture of the gospel and what good news that is. And so maybe today, if you've never done that, you've never trusted in Christ, I want to encourage you to, to give your life to Jesus today and, and ask him to forgive you of your sins. Or maybe you have already done that. And we see this beautiful picture of the gospel in Romans. And so maybe you want to share that with somebody else. Uh, I would encourage and challenge you to do that today. Uh, but as we come to a close, uh, I would ask that you would go to the Lord in prayer with me as we ask him to, to help us to take this gospel to the world with us. Let's pray together. God, we're thankful for who you are and for all that you've done. And Lord, we pray, God, that you would help us to take this beautiful gospel that you've given us a clear picture of. And God, that we would take that to share with others in the world around us. Lord, we thank you for loving us even in spite of us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.